Stillness Flowing, The Life and Teachings of Ajahn Chah by Ajahn Jayasaro, narrated by Gosaka. Chapter 1. A Life Expired. The Death of Luang Po Cha. Part 2. A Cremation. A winter afternoon in Ubon Province, northeast Thailand. Saturday, the 16th of January, 1993. A forest monastery, like a dark green patch upon a pale fabric of rice fields that stretch out fallow and dry. Tonight it will be cold and windy, but in mid-afternoon, the temperature in the shade of the gently swaying trees is 33 degrees. The calm and order of the scene belies a barely credible fact. Today, in an area usually inhabited by a hundred monastics, some 400,000 people are gathering, a number exceeding the population of any Thai city other than Bangkok. A year after the death of Luang Por Cha, it is the day of his cremation. There is a restrained but amiable hum of conversation in the air. The atmosphere is by no means funereal. Most people are dressed in white, the traditional colour of the lay Buddhist, although many official guests are in uniform and attendees from Bangkok are mainly in black. People sit on small mats and plastic sheets, wherever they can find a space. For the most part, they are exposed to the sun. Many are reading from one of the Dhamma books being distributed at the monastery entrance. They look up every now and again to enjoy the scene around them. Older village folk may be seen chewing betel nut. Dispersed throughout the multitude, cross-legged figures practice meditation. The number of people inside the monastery is constantly increasing. Outside, police are directing an interminable stream of traffic along a narrow road gaily lit with flags. The flapping of the yellow Dhamma wheel banners and the Thai tricolors extending as far back as the eye can see. White columns of pedestrians make their way along both sides of the road. In the temporary car parks amongst the fields outside the two-metre-tall monastery wall, tour buses, minibuses and trucks disgorge group after group of monks, nuns and lay supporters. They come from all over the country, many from Ubon and its neighbouring provinces of Yasothorn, Sisakin and Surin, but also from further afield, Udon, Nongkai, Pechabun. Indeed, the whole of Isan, northeast Thailand, is represented. There is also a sizable contingent from Bangkok, while others have travelled from as far north as Chiang Mai and as far south as Songkla. While some emerge from air-conditioned vehicles looking quiffed and cool, far more pile down from the back of pickup trucks, stiff and rumpled. But however people have travelled here, once disembarked, they carry with them a similar expectancy and sense of occasion as they join the inexorable flow of people entering the monastery. One large group, ten and more abreast, files through a large entrance and pass soldiers of the royal security detail who stand in small clumps under trees as benignly as soldiers can. Municipal water trucks are arriving on their latest trip. To their left, a small village of tented kitchens provides food, free of charge, to all those hungry from their journey. Behind them, discreetly laid back in the forest, they notice with relief long rows of temporary toilets, reassuringly clean. They see a first aid post with many nurses in blue and white uniforms, while, at another tent, people are lining up to receive free Dhamma books. The newcomers take their bearings from large painted maps by the side of the path. Courteous stewards patrol to and fro. But it is 300 metres away to their right that all movement is converging in a good-natured, unhurried way. 
for just within the northern boundary of the forest lies the centre of all attention. A white stupa, 32 metres in height, containing the body of Luang Po Cha. Today this graceful structure will function as the crematorium. Sometime later, a shrine at the heart of its central chamber will house Luang Po's relics on permanent public display. Today is the culmination of ten days of ceremonies and Dhamma practice. During this period, some 6,000 monks, a 1,000 nuns and over 10,000 lay Buddhists have camped out in the forest, while a slow tide of visitors has passed through the monastery in order to pay their last respects to the great master. Every day, from 3 a.m. until 10 p.m., all those resident in the monastery have participated in a daily schedule of chanting, meditation and listening to the Dhamma. Thousands of acts of kindness and generosity, big and small, have been the oil that has lubricated this huge and unprecedented event. Lay supporters from around the country have set up and financed the makeshift kitchens where volunteers have been hard at work for the whole ten days, cooking and serving food to guests from early morning until late at night. Various local government agencies have played their part behind the scenes, and the governor of Ubon has offered all of the resources at his disposal. Many businesses have made donations. One company has provided bottled water by the truckload. Early every morning, local bus companies, truck owners and individual car owners have ferried the thousands of monks into local towns and villages for their daily alms round. As the afternoon progresses, and the first cool northerly winds blow through the monastery, anticipation builds. The king and queen will arrive shortly. Their visit is the culmination of a series of consultations between the monastery and palace officials over the past months, an indication of how much etiquette is to be observed on such occasions. The royal motorcade arrives at 4.19pm and a ripple of excitement passes through the crowd. Their Majesties, King Pumipon and Queen Sirikit, take their seats in the specially constructed royal pavilion to the south of the stupa. The King, as is the custom on such occasions, is dressed in military uniform with a black armband, the Queen in ankle-length black. The Prime Minister and the head of the armed forces take their places some distance behind the royal couple, sitting at the head of the group of dignitaries all looking a little starched in their white civil service uniforms. In front of them, the elegantly tapering stupa forms an almost magical island, benign and still in the midst of a sea of people. The sound is muted, remarkably so for such a huge group of people. It is not just that everyone wants to be here, everyone wants to be here in the right way in a manner most fitting to the final farewell to a man who not only taught the way to peace, but who embodied it so memorably. The king and queen are certainly no strangers to large gatherings of people, but they seem to sense something special in the air. The king, a keen photographer, picks up the camera by his side every few moments to take pictures of the splendid sight in front of him. To the front and left of the royal pavilion is the pavilion reserved for the monastic guests of honour, headed by the supreme patriarch and including senior monks such as Lord Mahabua, the most revered forest master in the land, Jao Kun Prathebweti, P.A. Payuto, the most accomplished scholar, and Lung Po Panyananda, the greatest orator. Everyone else sits on the ground, Three colours predominate, the green of the forest, the white of the nuns, laity and stupa, and the ochre of the forest monks. Almost 6,000 monks are present, many seated cross-legged on their sitting cloths by the side of the concrete roads that approach from four sides and surround the stupa. They are still. Some gaze at the stupa. Many, eyes closed, are meditating. The pale faces 
and exposed right arms of the Caucasian monks catch the eye. Sixty of Luang Por's foreign disciples have converged from branch monasteries around the world. An Italian film crew is shooting a documentary. Journalists, with large identity badges pinned to their chests, are standing in front of cameras describing the scene. The funeral is being covered live on national radio and television. Tomorrow it will be front-page headlines in every national newspaper. The designated time arrives, and the king and queen rise from their seats and walk towards the stupa, shaded from the sun by large parasols held by attendants in traditional attire. The crowd on either side of them prostrate as they pass. Now the first part of the day's cremation ceremonies begins. The royal couple, surrounded by photographers and cameramen, enter the stupa. They bow to the coffin and then perform a series of offerings in accordance with a hallowed tradition. Firstly, they present robes to ten monks of senior ecclesiastical rank. These monks hold ornate fans in their left hand, and before taking possession of their robes, they chant a short verse of reflection on impermanence and cessation. Then, the royal couple offer candles, an elaborately decorated vessel of flowers and folded banana leaves, incense and sandalwood flowers to Luang Po. Finally, as monarch and the leader of the lay Buddhists of Thailand, the king presents the ceremonial royal cremation flame in its beautiful glass casket and returns to the royal pavilion. Once the royal ceremony has been completed, the monastics, led by the supreme patriarch and other senior monks, lay their candles and sandalwood flowers in front of the coffin. Following the monks come the nuns and then the lay Buddhists. Hundreds of thousands of people attend the cremation of a man they revere, and yet probably no more than a thimbleful of tears are shed. There is no wailing, no extravagant displays of grief, scarcely a red eye. But why should there be? They are not mourners. They believe that Luang Po was not this body that will shortly be consumed by flames, and that his mind has long been freed. In the words of the Buddha, gone beyond all descriptions. Preparations The Wat Ba Pong Sangha had been preparing for this funeral since the early years of Lung Po's illness. At first there had been some voices of dissent. One or two of the more elderly monks grumbled that preparing for someone's death usually brought it closer. But the consensus was that a funeral of the magnitude they anticipated required long preparation. It was clear that the major buildings in the monastery were in need of replacement or renovation. Toilet facilities were far from sufficient for a large gathering. A cremation site would have to be designated and prepared, and a stupa to house Luang Por's relics would need to be built. A new and comprehensive biography of Luang Por should be prepared and a huge number of smaller books of his teachings would need to be published as gifts for all the guests. There were enough funds in the monastery account to begin what needed to be done, and more would surely start to flow in as lay supporters became aware of the various projects planned. They applied themselves to their tasks in the way that they had been taught, one step at a time. In a meeting of the Sangha elders, it was decided that the cremation should take place on the northern side of the monastery, in the newer, more open area between the nursing kuti, where Luang Po had spent his last years, and the new Me Chi, white robe nun section. Earth was brought in by a seemingly endless convoy of lorries to raise the level of the site. Thousands of trees were planted around it, fertilized by human excrement provided by the municipality, a Jan Liam's much criticized idea that proved triumphantly successful in promoting rapid growth on extremely poor soil. The monks built a concrete road stretching from the inner monastery gate out to and around the cremation site, a total distance of some two kilometers. 
The work took nearly a year of workdays, from mid-morning to dusk, and often until late at night. The younger monks did the heavy work, lifting the bags of cement into the mixer and spreading the concrete on the road. The older monks squatted on their haunches making rebar. In November 1990, construction of a large new Dhamma hall began. It was completed in January 1992, just days before Lung Po's death. Ajahn Liam took on the role of architect and chief engineer on the project, despite having received only the most basic formal education some 40 years before. No plans ever needed to be drawn up because he kept them all in his head. Once completed, the building's white walls, large open windows connecting inside and out, and a high wood-clad ceiling gave it an airy simplicity well suited to purpose. Meanwhile, old goodies, monks' dwellings were renovated, and toilet blocks were built. Following Lung Po's death, the old, narrow monks' dining hall was demolished, and a new, much larger one built on the same site between the Dhamma Hall and the Oposita Hall, the building in which formal ceremonies are performed. For all of this construction, Wat Ba Pong's strict tradition of abstaining from all direct appeals for donations held fast. Donors offering money and building materials came forward of their own volition. All involved took pride in their work and executed it with devotion. There were no cut corners, no sloppy finishes. Each person's labour an expression of gratitude to their teacher. Finally, the only construction project that remained was the most challenging and the most important, Luang Por's stupa. This structure would form a lasting monument to him and house the relics that would provide a focus of devotion and pilgrimage in the future. It was not just that the recovered bone fragments would provide a tangible physical link to the departed teacher. The bones of enlightened ones commonly undergo an as yet inexplicable chemical transformation. After cremation, fragments remain that bear little resemblance to ordinary bone. In some cases, they may attain an almost jewel-like appearance. Lung Po's relics would be placed on permanent public display at the heart of the stupa. The elders decided that the stupa should be constructed in such a way that it might be used as a crematorium on the day of the funeral, and then afterwards for the crematory to be removed and replaced by the plinth on which Lung Po's relics would be displayed. An award-winning architect, Nitti Sathapitanon, offered his services free of charge, as did chief engineer Professor Arun Chaiseri. A design was produced that honoured the long tradition of stupa construction in Thailand. Its 50-metre base took the form of an inverted bell, echoing that of the great stupa of Nakhon Bathom. An elegant spire rose from this base to a height of 32 metres, homage to that of Thadpanom, the oldest and most revered stupa in northeast Thailand. Entrances at the four cardinal points of the compass led into a domed inner chamber, Floored with black granite, the chamber's ceiling was painted gold, as were the two concentric circles of pillars, the inner of which consisted of four pillars, representing the key teaching of the Four Noble Truths, and the outer circle of twelve pillars, representing the twelve links of dependent origination. Time was now of the essence. In an expression of the harmony of old and new in the project, a number of the larger sections of the stupa were prefabricated in Bangkok and transported by road to the monastery. As usual, the Sangha provided the bulk of the workforce. A request was made to all of the 153 branch monasteries to send monks for two-week shifts, with a particular appeal for those with relevant skill sets. The branch monasteries were divided into six rotating groups. This provided shifts of 100 comprised of 50 visiting monks, supplementing the 50 residents. The work was divided into different sections, metalwork, cement work, woodwork and electricity. In one sense, with the funeral looming, it was a race against time. And yet, for the monks, 
the work was also their practice, and they were well aware that less haste meant more speed. The monks dressed as usual, without hard hats and wearing flip-flops on their feet. Although many sustained cuts and bruises over the months of construction, there were no serious injuries. The monks and novices did not work alone. Lay supporters also offered their labour in their free time, and the local army commander sent groups of soldiers at regular intervals. Ajahn Liam said, When people work with the spirit of self-sacrifice, it's not difficult. Nobody made a fuss. Even when we worked late into the night, nobody asked when we were going to stop. Whether it was pouring with rain or the sun was beating down, there were no complaints. And so, the results every day were satisfying. It was a tribute to the harmony of Lumpur's disciples and, as Sangha work projects go, it was a historical event. We came together and did this task with pure hearts and without paying any attention to feelings of tiredness or exhaustion. Everyone made sacrifices. It was Dhamma through and through. On the 5th of January 1993, after a mere six months of focused effort, the stupa was completed. The one-year interval between Lumpur's death and the cremation had worked on many levels. Not only had it allowed sufficient time for the construction of the stupa, it had also given ample opportunity for all the people throughout the country and throughout the world who wished to pay their respects to Lumpur's body to make their way to Wat Bapong. Equally important, if more mundane, the choice of a January cremation ceremony had ensured reasonably temperate weather and bone-dry, empty fields around the monastery to accommodate the huge number of vehicles. But it was the year-long accumulation of good deeds and meditation practice, the giving of Dhamma talks and the listening to them, all dedicated to Luang Por, that contributed to the feeling that was so tangible amongst monks, nuns and laity on the day of the cremation. For them, today was the culmination of a period of reverence and recollection that had been sufficiently long and rich to truly reflect the greatness of the one who had passed away. After dark The night of the cremation. The wind is blustering through the amplification system and the temperature has dropped steeply. Lungta Mahabua, disregarding his own ill health, Discourses from the Dhamma seat set up on the western entrance to the stupa, illuminated by the spotlights that play upon it. He urges his listeners to uphold the traditions and practices taught by Lung Po Cha. Ajahn Sumedho, Lung Po's senior western disciple, continues the theme. The majority of people have returned to their homes by now. The 50,000 or so that remain are the hardcore, Wrapped in shawls and blankets, they will stay throughout the night, listening to Dhamma talks and meditating. Tanjau Kun Tebweti speaks of how Luang Po exemplified the qualities of a good friend, his warmth and care, his ability to instill respect and confidence in the teachings, his inspirational example, the way he taught and exhorted and instructed, his patience in dealing with his students' inadequacies and doubts, his ability to explain profound matters in clear ways, his absolute integrity in his dealings with his students. At midnight, the Dhamma talks end. Two hundred of Luang Por's most senior disciples climb up the stairs to the stupa and enter its inner chamber, where Luang Por's body lies in the thin, simple coffin all the surrounding paraphernalia removed. Other senior monks fill the area surrounding the chamber. More monks crowd together on the four sets of steps. The rest form an encircling mass below. The ceremony of asking for forgiveness is performed. It is the short ritual enacted whenever monks take formal leave of their teacher. Now, at the center of the stupa, Ten white-robed, shaven-headed laymen bow three times in unison to the coffin and, with the greatest of care, lift it up and slide it into the temporary crematory, a large metal box covered with boards, 
decorated with gold wax arabesques and floral designs that give it the appearance of a large candle. Ajahn Liam and the governor of Ubon place the royal flame in the crematory, which is tightly packed with sandalwood flowers and numerous sackloads of charcoal. The fire catches quickly, and Ajahn Liam closes the door with a firm twist of the handle. The monks sit in meditation. The silence is punctuated only by the faint sound of insects buzzing around the electric lights outside. But then, the temperature in the chamber starts to rise steeply. Eyes open at the awareness of the acrid smell and thickening air that means smoke is escaping into the chamber. It appears to be caused by a blockage in the chimney flue near the summit of the stupa. The fire is too fierce for the size of the air vents, perhaps too much charcoal or too much sandalwood, and the welded seams of the chimney are bursting. The fire cannot escape outside, and soon flames are licking out of the crematory looking for fuel. The wax birds surrounding the crematory melt. Flames start to consume the gypsum board and the plywood that conceal its metal walls. Monks file out of the smoke-thick chamber, quietly and without fuss. Once outside, many discard their robes and set up a chain. Buckets of water are carried into the chamber, and before too long, the fire has died out, leaving the crematory a blackened shell still shrouded with smoke. It is an anarchic episode, in a day of order and ceremonies performed with almost military precision, an unplanned epilogue to years of planning. Some people shake their heads at a feat of psychic power. Most see a fault in the stupa's design, and others prefer to look on it all as a last flourish of Lung Po's mischievous sense of humour. The monks put their robes back on. Meditators return to their meditations. The Dhamma talks resume. The cold wind continues to cut through thin cotton robes. Before long, the sky will begin to change colour. Another day will begin. <laughs>